about solving common problems that we have in our clinical practice. So if I would just ask somebody at random, if you could just take the mic and tell us one problem that you commonly face in your glaucoma practice. Would somebody like to just say something? No problems? Anybody? Other than saying I don't have patients. Actually, in my practice, often I face that my patient comes to check up, stopping the anti-glaucoma medication. The doctor may change the medicine, so I have stopped the medicine for last few days and while was... Just, just come, come again. Just come again on the question. Most often they come with the, uh, the stop the anti-glaucoma medicine. Though I have always mentioned it, you should continue it for lifelong, until I have stop it. But most often they stop it because uh, they know that doctor can change the medicine. So why I should purchase it has ended almost two weeks back there without drops. I'm facing this problem. So ever day. wondered why uh, a mobile service like, for example, Vodafone, Idea, they have you to periodically top up your ch uh, connection rather than give you a lifelong service and then forget about it? Ever wondered? <laughs> so I think periodically you need to re-emphasize to the patient about the importance of follow-up medication. Now let's say that you have written the medication and said use it for life. The disease can progress despite intraocular pressures being in the desirable range. Medication could produce side effects and you may need to change your line of management from say medical treatment to surgery. A case with open angle glaucoma over a period of time could become angle closure and you may need a laser iridotomy. So your management cannot be for life but always three to six months come back. And remember, you know the kind of practice you are in. If you want your patients to come back in six months, probably say th three months, depending on how the patient profile is. So that's where assessment comes into play. So my suggestion is don't write for life. No, actually I will write it because to stress the it is remote area. Most open patient comes to the chamber. I call them after three months or six months, but I always uh, prefer to write it lifelong because to stress the patient that that medicine is so important for him, like diabetes or hypertension. Even these points I also, in spite of that, they stop the medicine. It's so it is not about what you are wanting to say, it is what the patient interprets. Yes, so if you see a lot of doctors, they write, say, Timolol, BD, three months. Now the impression is that this drug has to be used for three months and then you can stop. So we need to reorient ourselves and see from the patient's perspective. Now, are you in private practice? Yeah. So I think it's always good to call your patients back more f frequently, actually. So it's good for you, the corporate, if you have more footfalls. More footfalls means more investigations. Right. So I think the economic factor needs to be looked into. No, in my, my area, that's economic factor is the main important. That's a rural area, purely rural area. Most are not so much educated. So I think this is what we are actually coming. So the first talk is by Dr. Sushma Tejwani. Yes, please. So oh, you have a question. So the problem I face hmm. is. Oh, ma'am. Yeah, please ask. So when to start treatment? I find a high pressure. The gonio has open angles. But the fields are a little. Uh, ambiguous. So the false positive and false negative, they're 4 and 3% or something like that. But there are some black dots. Okay. And is that a nasal step? Should I start treatment? So that is the dilemma I face. The pressures okay. are borderline. So you've so asked your question, but I need not answer now. Let's get the talks going. Sure. And we'll come back and answer that question. Sure. Okay. So let's have our first talk on intraocular pressure from Dr. Manish Shah, who's a practicing ophthalmologist and a pa in uh, Bombay and uh, focused on glaucoma. And he's a past office bearer of the Glaucoma Society of India. So good afternoon. Good afternoon, Devan, and thank you for including me in this uh, instruction course, which I promise is going to be very, very practically oriented. So intraocular pressure is where we usually start. So it's like having the smoking gun in your hand or a bloodied knife in your hand that incriminates you as the person who is the murderer if you have high pressure, means you have glaucoma. So this is how we have been ingrained into thinking and whether you're a glaucoma specialist, a normal general ophthalmologist, or even an optometrist, once you see a chart with a pressure which is about 21, 25, glaucoma does sparkle in your head. So that is the time we have to know whether that pressure that you are looking at is accurate or not. And 
a lot of conferences you might have attended where they tell you now, you know, intraocular pressure does not hold that important a status, but it is the most important causative risk factor for glaucoma. It is not a diagnostic parameter. You will not put the glaucoma label just based on intraocular pressure unless it is very, very high. But it is definitely the parameter which you are modifying. So the importance of intraocular pressure in your glaucoma chart is definitely primary importance. And it is the management target on which you are going to strategize on how to reduce your intraocular pressure and how to control this glaucoma. So the status of intraocular pressure is not anywhere gone down. Only the status is to be looked at in a different way. But we know very well that intraocular pressure measurement, we call it, but it's only an estimation based on non-invasive techniques, which could be the Goldman, indentation using a Shiots, an air puff tonometer, a dynamic contour tonometer, and so many new ones are coming up. So you, want, you may be using any one of these. But it is an estimation. It is not a measurement. You are not directly measuring the intraocular. That's the only way you can measure is to put in a, a probe into the eye to get the measurement. So in glaucoma management, as of 2019, 14 February today, we are using glaucoma, the Goldman Applination Tonometer as the accepted standard amongst all other tonometers, none of which are completely reliable. We know that even the Goldman is not completely reliable, but it is a known devil. It is not a known Devi, sorry, that's a spelling mistake, but it sounds very funny now. <laughs> all studies which we look at and fall back on and target pressures which we are going to set are all in the literature based on Goldman. So if you are using Goldman, you know where you are going based not only on your own patient, but what the whole world studies done in good centers and vast amount of patients have to say about that kind of a scenario. That is why we continue to use the Goldman Applination Tonometer as our baseline. As I said, the Goldman is well known to have known errors. Astigmatism compensation above three diopters of astigmatism is important. So if you have three diopters, take the reading in two axes. Corneal thickness, we have talked for at least 10, 15 years, we have been talking about how thick corneas, the Goldman overestimates. Very, very important is the large proptosed eye. You have myopic patients, you have patients who have eyes like these, which are, sl which are not technically proptosed, but they're definitely prominent. And when you try to lift the eyelid of this patient, you are going to press your thumb on the eyeball. And when you take the measurement, you are going to artificially record a higher pressure. What do you say about a thyroid patient like that? You cannot even, you may not even hold, you will just hold the eyelids, but you will probably put little pressure. And he has huge muscles, which you can't see over here, but if you do an MRI or a CT, you can see it. And these muscles are pressing the eye from inside. So you are artificially going to get a high pressure and you have patients on top who are squeezing. It happens all the time. So these are all the compounding factors where actually the patient pressure may not be that high, but you will artificially get a high reading. There are lesser known problems as well. Very common problem in my practice is patients on prostaglandins having huge eyelashes, one of which is growing a little bit down. You lift the eye, but that eyelashes comes right in the middle of your prism and you are in a hurry and you don't see. That eyelash produces resistance and I have actually seen how much pressure error occurs because of an eyelash being there in the prism between the cornea and the prism of your eye. Voluntary eye widening, you have bad co uncooperative patients on one side and you have the over cooperative patients who will sit there with, put their eyes as wide as they can and push their eyes in front sort of things and that artificially causes uh, uh, high pressure. Habitual large quantity of water drinking and sometimes medically advised large quantity of water drinking. Most common scenario is the health checkup scenario, which in Mumbai is very, very popular. Patient comes in on an empty stomach, gives his blood, then drinks one liter of water and then he has to wait for his bladder to get full for sonography. In that little half an hour, 45 minutes time, go and get your eye checked. And you record a pressure which is high. You record 25, 27 and there. So this is very common in every day. I don't know how many patients in Mumbai are put through this. And I myself used to be a part of a health checkup scheme before I tried to explain to them, never do this, but they never understood it. And you have Valsarva-like breath holding. 
you have these people you know who at every time they have to go in for anything they hold their breath they squeeze themselves and sometimes the table is too close they are fat so they are taking in their stomach you are doing all these kind of movements which actually is raising eye pressure and you are nicely measuring over there and getting a high, high eye pressure so you need to look at all that so how do you go about ruling out all this if you see high pressure without typical glaucoma changes that is one of the red flags and after ruling out all this what do you do you treat using the OHT guidelines which has been from the OHTS in absence of risk factors you treat pressures about 25 in presence of risk factors like thin cornea enlarged you know all this I'm not going to go into this but you have the OHTs also need to be treated if they have risk factors but there is always a but and I think Devan will very much agree with me before you start applying the OHTS factors rule out angle closure before applying these OHTS risk guidelines because you have people who are logging onto the internet getting the star calculator putting on all the risk factors but haven't looked at the angle this is the most serious error made every day in clinics is not to look at the angle carefully so before you apply OHTS please rule out angle closure then you have the other extreme where you have this changes field changes but the pressures are well below 21 or quite a little below 21 and you don't know what is the cause you can get artificially low readings with Goldman as well in thin corneas we know that very well sometimes it's a technical error you have put too much stain or your assistant has put too much stain or there is already some stain on the prism head which you haven't wiped so careless technique is one of the common causes and the other one is the deep sunken eye again you have patients whose eyeballs are way inside their orbits you have to keep on moving in front to oppose and sometimes your range of your slit lamp is gone and your apposition is actually less than the area which you should and you artificially record a lower pressure so when just when you see a patient walking in with one of those eyes which I showed you in the picture your mind has to be aware I'm going to probably artificially high record this patient and when you see those guys with their eyeballs right inside be careful you might under record their pressures low pressures and glaucoma changes you have a various differential diagnosis like neurological cases disc anomalies ocular ischemia burnt out glaucoma patients who had steroid responsive uveitic traumatic glaucomas and old vein occlusions which the discs still appear like glaucoma the field changes appear like glaucoma but these are not glaucoma and of course you have the classical NTG which you have to diagnose after you rule out the other four things so the important take home message which I would like to give is that IOP is a known fluctuating parameter so you always have to take many readings sometimes in the single visit you may take one reading send them for dilating or send them for perimetry and come back and take another reading awareness of known sources of error you have to be aware of those things which I told you and take the appropriate remedy diagonal variation is known therefore we recommend in many cases to check the pressures at different times in the day if not on the same day maybe on a different day and in some situations after doing all this you follow up the patient like a glaucoma patient and over time you come to know of factors which were playing a role which didn't come to light in the beginning so the basic thing of a glaucoma management is even when you are not sure that one of the ladies here got up and asked that question I'm not sure just remember you don't have to take a decision today a few two three dots somewhere in the nasal field sit quietly keep on repeating perimetries keep on doing the tests again you have time to sit and think what's going on but rule out angle closure first thank you very much thank you dr manish for highlighting one simple point a raise in trochlear pressure you must do a gonioscopy that's the first step and rule out angle closure and it's not just angle closure you must look for signs of intermittent angle closure like goniosinicky patchy pigment on shawl base line so th these are things that you actually need to uh, look at I have one question the normal intraocular pressure range is 11 to 21 millimeters of mercury right how many people use an OCT does the OCT contain data for Indian eyes no does the visual fields contain data for Indian eyes yes 11 to 21 millimeters of mercury is the statistically defined limit of normal in Caucasian eyes with the short sternometer why have we not questioned ourselves as to why an Indian study doesn't look at this so yes an Indian all studies have looked at it from Indian population based study the median the mean that they found was very close to 16.5 
and because two standard deviations above and below would represent the upper and lower limit of normal, so 11 to 21 with can be taken as the statistical normal for Indian eyes also. How many people look at the optic disc as a routine for all their glaucoma patients or uh, suspects? What instrument do you use? 90D. How do you document your findings? Diagrammatically. Anybody for disc photographs? OCT, HRT, GDX. How frequently do you do your disc examination? Every visit? You do it with dilated pupils or undilated? Both. So those who dilate every visit? No. At least once a year? So that's a good practice. So good practices would be checking the intraocular pressure with the Goldman applanation tonometer at every visit. How many people own a Goldman applanation tonometer? Now of the people who have raised their hands, how many use the Goldman applanation tonometer regularly? Okay, so see the number has dropped. So you need to, it doesn't take time. It's just a matter of getting used to it. So maybe in the busy OPD, last five patients do an applanation tonometer consistently for about two weeks. And the third week, you won't feel the pressure of, I have spent more time just doing an applanation tonometer. That feeling will go away. Glaucoma today is described by changes in the optic disc. And the next, next talk is how best to visualize the optic disc. It is not just about picking up glaucoma changes. It is also differentiating it from non-glaucoma changes, particularly when you see variants of normal. And this would include congenital anomalies of the optic disc. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Medha Prabhudesai, and she's going to talk about how the important it is to look at the optic disc and how much it troubles us. Uh, good afternoon. I think uh, many of us, uh, many of you would be there in the morning session. So. We have covered glaucoma. So these are the typical cases where you know that the patient is having glaucoma and nothing else. So majority of our glaucoma practice consists of this. But as we know that eyes are like windows of your brain and your systemic diseases. So let's look at them, whether they have glaucoma or they don't have glaucoma. Now a patient, a 31 year old male patient, IT professional, he was residing in Australia and he was referred, he came to India to visit his parents and was referred to me for glaucoma evaluation, second opinion, basically. Patient had already undergone SLT, right eye three times, left eye four times, every alternate week. He was diagnosed as glaucoma there. Uh, see his refractive profile, it was minus six, 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 and six. Pressures were 16 when he came to me and CCT was slightly on lower side. Gonia was open, slit lamp examination was non, like it was totally normal. These were her optic nerves. So looking at his, I can just say that these are the large optic nerves with her high CD. So I said, okay, we'll investigate and see what you exactly have. So these are his investigations. As you can see that OCT is showing everywhere all around red code. So is this glaucoma? Obviously not. Perimeter is normal. There is slight enlargement of the blind spot, maybe because he has high CD, that's it. And this red disease or red disease, what we call, patient definitely has high CD, as you see here, 0 0.87, 0 0.87. But the most important thing is that this is away from the normal distribution what the OCT has shown. So this is a disease of what we call as a red disease. So this patient doesn't have glaucoma and he has unnecessarily undergone SLT, which was totally not indicated in this patient. So there are various signs of glaucoma. They can be dependent on the ONH size, shape, vascular signs, and peripapillary changes. Uh, less critical of these signs, what we know as is high CD ratio. Disc pella definitely is not glaucoma. Bean potting or a deep CD, deep uh, set uh, cup is also not glaucoma. Vessel bearing so, or bearing of circumlinear vessel, nasalization of vessels or laminar dot sign are all less critical signs of glaucoma. Now, these are the optic nerves and we are going to see one by one whether they have glaucoma or not. Maybe you can just see and uh, keep it in your mind to see whether they are suffering for glaucoma or not. 
this is the seventh and the last eighth case ok. So, this is a patient who was referred to me for glaucoma. If you look at the disc, there is hardly any cupping, but the most important thing is these are the small cups. Again, they are like outside the normal population what a optic nerve uh, has. So, these are definitely small discs and this is a RNFL red free photographs. Right eye to me looks normal, left eye do you think it is abnormal? It is difficult to say, but now look at uh, the history of this patient. Patient came to me for blood blurred vision for last 15 days. Vision was less in the left eye, pressure was 42 and this patient had pseudo exfoliation. But the disc was like this after the obviously the corneal edema when subsided we took the photographs. And now these are the fields which are like totally unreliable. So instead of repeating we said ok let us look at the OCT what OCT is showing. Now here you can see that the there is thinning of RNFL here though they are small disc this area is just 1.16 here. Uh, this Swepsworth OCT also shows RGC and RNFL thinning over here. And now if you look at the optic uh, red free photograph here, you can see there is subtle RNFL defect superiorly and inferiorly, though the optic nerve is not showing any cupping. So this can be due to the decrease of pressure from 40 to lower teens where there is obliteration of the cup, but the RNFL defects are still there. So the first case has glaucoma on history as well as ONH findings here. Second case left eye here, there is slight vertical enlargement of the uh, this thing here, but it is difficult to say whether the neuronated retinal rim has thinned out or not. RNFL if you see red free there is a inferotemporal defect over here. So even if we do not subject this patient to investigations though we have diagnosis in our mind that this patient is having glaucoma in his in the left eye. So obviously we will help uh, uh, other tests to come to a conclusion and can conclude that this patient is having glaucomatous optic neuropathy. Next case, these are the CD ratios, very large discs obviously and high CD ratio and if you see the fields are normal, CD is a very high, hardly any RNFL thinning over there, even in the red free there was no thinning. So again we can conclude that this patient is having high CD high and large uh, optic nerve heads. As you can see here the disc area is more than 3. Next patient reported for cataract evaluation. Here can you see there this is a large C again a CD ratio is very high. But in the right eye there is thinning of neuroretinal rim inferiorly vertical enlargement is there and even there is a suspicion of neuroretinal rim thinning superiorly. So now if you see the red free photographs here you can see that there is RNFL thinning over here and which can be confirmed with perimetry as well as the OCT over here. So we can conclude that the right eye has glaucomatous optic neuropathy. Tacillated fundus, it is difficult to say whether these patients have glaucoma or not. So we need to investigate these patients regularly and to see whether they are developing glaucoma, especially when they have other risk factors like high pressure, thin cystity or any defects like this. In the right eye, there are defects which are suggestive of glaucoma. So we need to keep repeating perimetry and OCT for these patients to say whether they have glaucoma. And you now if you see that this uh, defect there, you may find out there is a subtle defect in the right eye inferiorly and a defect superiorly over here. So these are the patients need, uh, need repeated uh, certain tests and repeated follow ups. Now this patient a very young patient 34 year old male patient with uh, came for came with PSC cataract and he was advised surgery elsewhere. But look at his disc. You can see that the neuroretinal rim is thinned out everywhere and there is all other signs of glaucoma are there. Here also you can see that the RNFL thinning is there in both the eyes and these are the OCT and perimetry findings over here. So whether the PSC cataract will help him definitely but 
you have to explain to this patient that you have other problem going on. And when questioned repeatedly, patient described that he was using steroids for a very long time, topical steroids for allergic conjunctivitis, and this can be a burnt out glaucoma because pressure was normal that time. So we need to repeat fields and other tests for these patients before subjecting this patient to cataract. Another, a 57-year-old male patient, systemic, there was nothing. Patient was using latanoprost for 12 years. Patient had perimetry done three times, but he didn't have any reports. Uh, you can say that uh, right eye vision was normal, left eye was less, and pressures were normal. Nuclear sclerosis, uh, sclerosis was there, and uh, angle was open, tilts, SS. These are his optic nerves. So do you think the right eye has glaucoma or not? The disc which I had shown previously. Left eye looks fairly okay to me. What about his right eye? Can you see any RNFL defect over here? There is slight thinning of RNFL over here. So we said, okay, let's do at least perimetry. You have undergone perimetry three times, so let's see what it is. And this was his perimetry. So what is this now? Patient has congress defect, which is paracentral in both eyes. It is same. So we asked the patient to do MRI angiography and it re re revealed old infarct at the posterior tip of the right occipital cortex. So this was causing the defect over here and he didn't have glaucoma at all. So this also you have to find out whether the patient is really suffering for glaucoma or not. And this patient, uh, Ayurvedic physician, he was diagnosed as NTG and he was on treatment, came for so second opinion because he has blurred vision intermittently Pre vision was 6, 12, N12, left eye was better, and pressures were 12. Gonioscopy suggestive of angle closure, but it was few slides, one or two, it's okay. So, but uh, it was opening on compression. So we said, okay, we'll do a uh, test for you because I couldn't find anything. And, but you can see here that the optic disc has much more pallor as compared to Cupping. Even the neuroretinal rim is pale over here. So we said, Ki, let us find out why. Perimetry was non-conclusive. Even the OCT was non-conclusive. So we asked the patient to do all these other parameters which we do for NTG, like chest X-ray, uh, other autoimmune markers, including MRI. So this was his MRI findings. So patient had chronic microvascular ischemic changes and he had generalized cerebral, at cerebral and cerebellar atrophy. So patient was having something else apart from not, and not glaucoma. So all these patients need detailed evaluation if they are not fitting into uh, what we call as glaucoma. There are certain comorbid situations, of NPDR with glaucoma, CRVO with glaucoma. One interesting case, a patient, I just want to share last case. Uh, this patient would refer to me for glaucoma and uh, when I saw the right eye disc was like this, left eye was slightly hazy, but looked like glaucomatous. Uh, when we did perimetry, it was like this. And he had a decent drop of vision in the left eye, thinking that might be wipeout or the advanced glaucoma. It was referred to me for further investigation. But we did certain procedure and patient improved to this. So what was it in the left eye? So when we checked his fundus, we could find out that there was a HST over there and a very shallow RD in the central portion. So the most important thing is that when you are looking at the ONH to find out whether the patient has glaucoma or not, don't forget to see the fundus of the patient, especially macula and retina. So always compare both eyes and look for possible signs rather than only instrument analysis. Uh, significant defects on OCT should be matched with ONH findings and the visual field findings and do not rely much more on color coding of the OCT results to indicate normal versus abnormal. So these are the things you should remember. Whenever there is disc pillar more than cupping, you have to look something other than glaucoma. And if the fields and the nerves should match, if not, you have to look for media opacities or retinal or macular diseases. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Medha. We now have Dr. Devendra Sood, who needs no introduction. It's an honor to share the dais with him. Dr. Sood will inform us about visual fields, about not getting misled 
by visual fields, how to interpret them and how they can be misleading. So widen your horizons beyond ophthalmology. Dr. Sood. Okay, so uh, thank you. Actually, this instruction course is courtesy Dr. Mayuri Kamar, who's not able to come here. And uh, you know, I interpreted the topic a little differently. And my interpretation was that the fields are narrowing over time, that is the disease is progressing. But what else do we need to keep in mind as a possibility for the glaucoma progressing and what else could be an artifact in this thought, uh, thought process? So I think our goal in glaucoma or any other disease actually is to improve the health of the patient as a whole. And for this, we, as clinicians, need to give appropriate treatment, balancing the need for treatment and the possible side effects of the uh, treatment. So we all know that blindness in glaucoma is the rule. It's just a matter of time. And our treatment only delays that blindness. And hence, detection of glaucoma progression is crucial for identifying those at risk for visual loss. So there cannot be and will not be a consensus as to what means what progression means in, uh, in glaucoma. So if you look at definitions for glaucoma, they come from clinical trials, and there's always a clinician's perspective. So if you look at this, 40% of the retinal ganglion cells need to be lost before you have a demonstrable change on perimetry. These changes happen earlier, and nerve fiber layer changes happen there. So previously, the accepted norm was that structural damage to the optic, nerve, optic disc will precede functional loss on uh, uh, will precede the functional loss on uh, visual fields. The OAT study, the EGPS shows that structural and functional uh, changes need not coincide in patients. And some patients in the ocular hypertensive study convert uh, to glaucoma. So the OATS and the EGPS study found that disc and disc changes happened first. But in the EMGT study, changes in the visual field happen first as compared to disc changes. Now, if you look at the advanced glaucomas, the AGS study, they did not have a disc outcome. They only focused on assessing function based on visual fields. While the CNTG study, that's the collaborative normal tension glaucoma study, had focused on disc and field changes. So other studies have shown that visual field changes may precede the development of optic disc changes. Now from a clinician's perspective, currently the gold standard is to document a structural change to the optic disc as a functional loss on white or white perimetry. And white on white perimetry is also the gold standard to assess the rate of progression over time. So if you see these two patients, we all know that all patients will not progress at the same rate. And if you see the uh, uh, figures, patient A is unlikely to achieve critical loss of vision during his lifetime and does not need aggressive treatment. So what exactly is progression on perimetry? When a new defect appears in an area which was not involved earlier, there is a deepening of a pre-existing scotoma, or there is an expansion of a pre-existing scotoma to involve new areas, or suddenly you have a generalized reduction in sensitivity. So it's important for us at this stage to differentiate between progression and fluctuation. We need to identify the extent of change that has happened, the areas which are involved, and also know the rate of progression. So for glaucoma patients, if you're a Humphrey user, a central 30 or a 24 degree test is fine. If you're an octopus user, a 32 or a G1 program should suffice. In advanced glaucomas, if on the Humphrey, you'd like to use a 10-2 or a macular program. On the octopus, a 12 degree works equally well. Most tests on the Humphrey should now be done with the CETA standard. That should be the norm for all of us. On the octopus, you could use a top or a dynamic strategy. The frequency of testing will vary depending on the severity of the disease. So first step is form a baseline. And two visual fields over 12 months is fair enough, even though studies recommend that you could do two fields in a month's time. But remember, it's an out-of-pocket expense for the patient. Advanced glaucomas, you could come back and do two visual fields over six months. And then periodically monitor the patient with visual fields done say once a year for patients with early glaucoma, once in six months for moderate, and three months every three months for patients with advanced glaucoma. The frequency of examination can be varied. Let's say the patient has a fluctuation in intraocular pressure or develops a disc hemorrhage. 
then you can come back and do your fields more uh, frequently. Then there are confounders to assessing progression. For example, you cannot compare the visual fields done with the Humphrey with that done of an octopus machine. You cannot compare the visual fields done on two or three different Humphrey machines together. Similarly, fields done with the octopus, different machines cannot be compared. And then one needs to get good baseline fields. A good baseline visual field is a reliable visual field with more, not more than a minor fluctuation in the mean deviation. We must keep the learning curve in mind. We cannot compare visual fields done with different programs. We can only compare fields done with similar strategies. So you can't compare a full threshold with a CETA standard or a CETA fast with a CETA standard. We cannot compare fields done with a stimulus size 5 with a stimulus size 3. So beware of these anomalies that can happen. So avoid confounders while assessing progression. Use the same program, same strategy, and the same stimulus size. Almost always use software for progression analysis. And software will work in two ways. It would be event-based, which would help us to compare with baseline. And there would be a trend analysis to assess the trend, which would give us the rate of progression over time. Now, this is the case profile of one of our patients, a 52-year-old gentleman who came first to us in 2003 for a second opinion. He had been diagnosed to have glaucoma because of a raised IOP. He was on blood thinners and had an altered lipid profile, no allergies, and he was on treatment with latanoprost and levobrinolol containing eye drops, no family history of glaucoma. The best corrected visual acuity was 6.6 and N6. Aptination pressures, cornea adjusted were 18 and 16. Shallow chambers, discs were normal with healthy rims. Gonioscopy showed a cludible angle, so our working diagnosis was primary angle closure. We went ahead and did a laser iridotomy, and on subsequent follow-up, his pressures remained between 14 and 16 millimeters of mercury. We got the visual fields done. This is 2004. The fields in the right, left eye were normal, and the right eye was normal. Again, re-emphasizing our clinical examination that the optic disc was normal. Patient continued to be on treatment and came back in 2005, when we, 2015, when we felt he had developed a mild pallor of the optic disc. Pressures at that time were 13 and 15 millimeters of mercury. We did the visual fields. In the right eye, there was a, there was a small change that you can see uh, close to the blind spot here. But at that point of time, we did not consider it significant and disregarded our observation about the uh, temporal pallor. The mean defect, uh, when in 2015, when we did the, uh, the, the, trend, the, event analysis, the trend analysis, we found that in the right eye, the diffuse defect had shown a small drop. But you know, many of us, when we look at this, would consider it as not being significant because in the software, the statistical analysis markers were not signifying that this was uh, significant. Patient then came, this was January 2015. Patient came back again subsequently having blurred vision. And in the left eye, we found there was a much more emphasis, temporal involvement here. And this time, we asked for an MRI. And when we picked up the MRI, we found there was a large cellar, supracellar, and a right paracellar region elevating the optic chiasma and displacing the right cavernous uh, uh, artery. So the fields were done. He underwent a neuro neurosurgery. Fields were done, and this depression here that we were seeing in the left eye had got better. And when we did the, uh, the trend analysis, we found that in the left eye, the depression that was happening has subsequently moved up, implying that the compressive effect has disappeared. So we talked in the initial examples of how a glaucoma patient need not have a glaucoma, and it could be a neurological problem. I'm showing you here a glaucoma patient, an established glaucoma patient on treatment who went on to develop a neurological problem. So just because the fields are narrowing doesn't mean glaucoma. It could mean glaucoma plus something else. And this patient had developed a new disease, a neurological disease. So remember, life expectancy is on the increase. More and more of our glaucoma patients are going to live longer. Neurological lesions like age-related atrophy, cerebrovascular lesions, age-related macular lesions are also going to increase. So we need to rule out non-glaucoma-related progression in a patient with uh, glaucoma, and we must not miss a new neurological disease in a patient with an established glaucoma. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sood. Do we have any questions for Dr. Sood? 
Okay. We now have Dr. Kamini Prajapati, who is going to talk about medical management, medical management disasters. Good evening, everybody. First, I would like to thank AIOC and Dr. Mayuni Madam and Dr. Sooth for giving me an opportunity to present this talk today. As we know, glaucoma can be treated either medically by laser treatment or by surgical treatment. For the medical treatment, every medicine has some side effect. Each and every patient, each and every eye should be individualized. Same way, in the glaucoma, if you are treating patient either with the topical treatment or with the oral medications, there might be a systemic absorption of the topical drops, or that might be a drug interactions, or that might be a idiosyncratic reactions. So, now, in our glaucoma management armamentarium, there are many types of drugs available. There is a sort listed. I am presenting in the base of the case series. The case when a 45 years old female IT professional came to the ophthalmology with complaining of redness and itching in both eyes. And she is the IT. So she is telling about she was telling about the drowsiness, but is one of the complaints since two weeks. As she has diagnosed as a primary open anger glaucoma, and she was on bremonidine treated eye drops, TID since five weeks, and anti-allergic eye drops for redness since two weeks and the drowsiness has been developed since two weeks. Keeping in mind the bremonidine side effect, the not all ophthalmologists or not all physician has their, in their mind. So she has gone to the physician, general physician. The general physician has done all the blood investigations and even they have referred to the neurophysician for her drowsiness. And there the MRI brain was done and it was normal. Now when she came to us, the ocular examination, vision was 6x with correction. When I evoked the lead, the, there was a papillary reaction. The CCT corrected IOP was 16 and 15 in right and left eye respectively. Gonioscopy showed open angles. Do not rely on anybody's gonioscopy, do by itself. Central findus was 0 0.5 CD ratio with health neuro healthy neuroretinal rim. So we have asked to stop demonidine for drowsiness and redness, and her complaint was gone after three weeks. When she came to follow up, patient was attentive and there was no complaint. So we have stopped anti-allergic two on the next follow up and posted for further investigations. So whenever patient is on bremonidine, try to uh, accumulate the systemic side effects of drowsiness, dry nose, dry mouth, headache, etc., apart from local side effects. Asked to have a punctum occlusion to prevent the systemic absorption of the drug. It should not be used with the MAO inhibitors and it should be avoided in the pediatric patient to avoid the CNS side effect like somnolence and apnea. In the case two, we have a 31 year old female came to ophthalmology for sudden painful dimness of vision in both eyes since a day. She was on some systemic medication for headache since three weeks. The prescription was not available. She was past history of on and off headache with nausea, which was subsided by analgesic tablet. When we examined the pa patient, visual acuity was 660 without glasses in right and left both eye. With the correction, it was minus four spherical. Anterior segment was bilateral conjunctival condition. Right eye shows mild corneal epithelial haze and both eye had cello anterior chambers. Pupil was normal in size, but reaction to light was decreased in the right eye. The uptonus and tonometry showed right eye 40 millimeter of mercury and left eye 34. So we have started indexing manitol 20% 200 ml IV state after measuring the blood pressure. The post manitol IOP was right eye 30 and left eye 24 millimeter of mercury. Then we have done the gonioscopy. It was so, uh, had it had closed angles with convex iris, and to rule out the mechanism of these closed angles, whether there is a pupillary block or not, we have done UBM, and our UBM showed the ciliocorridor detachment. So we have done a B scan too, and B scan showed mild corridor effusion, which was right eye more than the left eye. The central fundus shows right eye hyperemic disease as comparative to left eye. 
We asked to have a bremorinin and timolol eye drops with the analgesic tablet, but not given tablet acetazolamide, keeping in mind the sulfonamide derivative reaction. On the next day, when the patient came to us, showed the prescription, she was on tablet topiramate 50 milligrams since three weeks for her migraine. Vision was slightly improved, that is 612 NIGPH, but the myopia is still there, that is minus three spherical, patient, is gain, uh, patient has gained 69. The intraocular pressure was 24 and 20 in right and left eye. Both eye cup disc ratio was normal, but right eye disc was still hyperemic. So we are advised to discontinue the tablet topiramate, continue bremodidine and timolol eye drops, and ask to follow up after five days. There was no complaint. Vision was regained to 6-6. Six, six. There was clear conjunctiva and cornea, formed anterior chambers, but, and the pupil were also normal. So IOP is also normal, but the gonioscopy shows still occludable angles, uh, but the UVM shows the reattachment of the ciliary body. But the B skin shows no choroidal effusion. So we have stopped Remodinin and Timolol and asked the patient to come after two weeks where everything was normal and patient had no open angles. So bilateral simultaneous acute angle glossal glaucoma, if with myopic shift and forward displacement of the iris lens diaphragm, may be due to the idiosyncratic reaction to sulfonamide and its derivatives it may be due to adrenergic and anticholinergic, including antidepressants, general anesthetic drug, botulinum toxins, and anticoagulants. It may be there with the microspherophakia, Vokanegi Harada syndrome, or with the snake bite. It is due to the immune response of the alternate proteins of those drug metabolites. But it is rare with the single dose. And UBM is a very important tool to rule out whether there is a ciliocoronary detachment or there is a pupillary block. A, 40, a 54 years old male refer for our tertiary care center for the fundus examination as patient was admitted in the medical ward with history of acute breathlessness, headache, nausea, and muscle cramps and weakness. These all are the signs of lactic acidosis what the medicine people were suspected. Patient was a known case of non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus and recently diagnosed query interstitial lung disease. On fundus examination, patient had 0.8 cup disc ratio with unhealthy neuroretinal rim and left eye 0.6 cup disc ratio with healthy neuroretinal rim. As patient was in ward, the torchlight examination was done, was done. The anterior segment was normal, except the pupil was dilated under midriasis. So we have done the Perkins aplanation tonometry, that is handheld aplanation. The right eye was 17 and left eye was 13 millimeter of mercury. As patient, and then we take a, the, took the history. Patient was a known case of primary open angle glaucoma of both the eyes since last two years. He was using both eye trevopros eye drops HS. But before a week, patient has increased IOP in the right eye, that is 36 millimeter of mercury, and the treating physician has started tablet acetazolomide 250 QID since one week with bremodidine and timolol eye drops. As patient was a patient was known insulin dependent diabetes mellitus, he was taking tablet metformin 500 milligram BID since two years, and under investigation for interstitial lung disease. Keeping in mind the acetazolamide adverse reaction with the metformin, we have asked patient to stop acetazolamide and timolol as patient has a lung disease and started topical carbonic anhydrase inhibitor and posted for a right and trabeculectomy as I say, after patient general condition improves. So we recommend that oral acetazolamide should be given after proper history taking Encourage the patient to drink more water, not sir, I state that one, uh, st state that one liter or one and a half liter, and supplement the potassium intake da daily, as acetazolamide inhibits CYP3A4 enzyme activity and enhances the adverse effects of metformin and high doses of aspirin. So appropriate communication with the treating physician has to be there in patients of epilepsy, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, history of sulfa allergy, chronic kidney diseases, while creatinine clearance is 10 to 50 milliliter per minute, or renal stone or altered liver function test. 
and beta blockers must be avoided in patients of cardiovascular respiratory or CNS problem. It may increase the cholesterol level or reduce glucose tolerance or mask the hypoglycemia in patient of diabetes. It may exacerbate the symptoms of hyperthyroidism. And I advise if you have to use the beta blockers, then ask the patient to have a punctum occlusion or use the non-selective beta blockers. A last case, a 36-year-old male referred to the tertiary eye care center for right eye blurred vision with wavy margin of the objects. Patient had history of right eye cataract surgery with intraocular lens implantation was done for traumatic cataract one month back. Patient had increased post-op IOP in the right eye one week. Patient was on antibiotic steroids eye drops and uh, lubricant eye drops. And after increasing the IOP, the physician has started bimetoprost plus timolol eye drops in the same eye. Patient had hypertension. On visual acuity, right eye was 618, non -impro not improving with glass and pinhole, while left eye was normal. The anterior segment showed right eye anti uh, flare and uh, 2 plus and SALS 1 plus. There was a pseudophagia with paracentral posterior capsular opening. And CCT corrected IOP in the right eye was 18 millimeter of mercury with open angle with pigmentation of trabecular meshwork plus four. The central fl uh, fundus was normal, but the macula shows edema. So we have referred our, to our retina colleague and they find the patient had cystoid macular edema, which was confirmed on OCT and later on on FFA. Keeping in mind the bimetoprost side effect on the macula, particularly in the post-operative patient, we have omitted the bimetoprost and started bimodinin and timolol. As patient is iridocyclitis, that is flare 2 plus and SALS 1 plus, we have started cyclopentyloid eye drops, BID, and nepafenic eye drops, whatever retina colleague has started. On one month follow-up, visual acuity was improved and patient's macular edema was regressed. So prostaglandin analogs has side effect of its clinical detectable inflammatory side effect as well as onset or recurrence of uveitis and cystoid macular edema. Predisposing factors for macular edema are complicated cataract surgery, posterior lens capsular rupture, apiretinal membrane, diabetic retinopathy, and retinal vein occlusion. It may be occur at one day or after a few months, but it is reversible. So, Every time you have to take the thorough history and always, always listen to the patient. India is a hub of diabetes mellitus as well as nowadays the hypertension is also increasing. So we have asked the patient about the all systemic medication, what he or she is on. As the systemic side effects are more with the beta blockers and carbonic anhydrase inhibitor as compared to the, the ocular side effects. And thank you very much for your kind listening. Thank you. Sir. Dependent on their staff to do the counseling. Okay. So do you find that there is a difference in terms of motivation for using? Uh, counseling was an integral part here. So maybe you should step in a little into the counseling part uh, instead of just saying for, uh, treatment for life. Okay. So I think it's very important that counseling be done by doctors. I know in busy practices it is very difficult. So model your clinic in such a way that the counselor is perhaps in the room next or next to next door to you and you have this option of walking across to the counselor's room. You may not open your mouth, but for the patient it is reinforcement when the doctor is present when the counselor is talking. So you need to uh, work out the flow in your clinic so that your presence is felt even in the counselor's room when the patient is there. Uh, Thank so you. our next speaker is Dr. Vanna Nath, who works at the Ragudeep Eye Clinic in, um, in Ahmedabad. Thank you, Dr. Sood. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm very grateful for this opportunity, and I thank Dr. Mayuri Kamar and Dr. Vasavada for this opportunity. Uh, it's deliberately titled, We Are In This Together. Counseling, perhaps, is the most neglected part of our glaucoma practice. So what is counseling? It is a scientific process of assistance extended by an expert in an individual situation to a needy person, where we provide the help, the support, the advice, and the guidance. And there are internationally dedicated journals for counseling. If you go through these journals, they are entirely dedicated 
for communication in healthcare for our patients. So what is the challenge as far as glaucoma is concerned? Yes, it is a chronic disease. It needs active participation from patients and their relatives. It needs regular and lifelong follow-up, as we have been hearing since the last three hours. It needs timely intervention of more aggressive treatment. And our final goal has to be the prevention of blindness. Primary glaucomas are sometimes asymptomatic, so the patients don't come to us early enough. What is gone will never come back. They are irreversible and will therefore need lifelong management. There is a startling statistic that says that 50% or more patients stop their medication by the end of one year. Other statistics say why there is progression to field loss, why there is progression to blindness, and the most common factor is non-compliance. 28 to 58% of glaucoma patients progress because of non-compliance. So who shoulders this burden of the responsibility? It is us caregivers, it is us the doctors, it is us who has to shoulder the burden of identifying and improving compliance and it does lie on our shoulders and we cannot shrug this off. Why do we need counseling? Glaucoma medications work if patients use them. That is the basic fact. There are types of counseling, directive, non-directive, and eclectic. So let's see. Directive means counselor-centric. is the doctor who directs the patient, who is informing the patient about the disease. So primarily, once the disease is diagnosed, it is the doctor's duty to inform the patient that he has this disease, to explain what this disease is, to interpret the findings for this patient, and to advise the patient on what he has to do. Non-directive is a permissive. It is patient-centric. Patient takes his own decisions. Yes, you have told me that I have this disease. I'll decide whether I want to see somebody else, or I'll decide whether I want to continue the treatment or not. And counselor takes a passive role. Obviously, this is the kind of counseling we do not want. The best part and the best type of counseling is eclectic. You take the best of both. Informed explanation to the patient, a patient's responsible relative who is going to be a great decision-making factor about the intervention, about the patient's follow-up. If they are old people, how often can they come to your clinic? And we combine the and select the best management between the counselor. Who can be a counselor? First, of course, is the doctor themselves. Second, you can train your staff. You can have a dedicated counselor, which we do have at our clinic. The techniques of counseling can be in various ways. Every six months, have a sort of a get-together of all your glau glaucoma patients. Call them at a dedicated time. Show them some audiovisual presentations, ask their feedbacks, find out their difficulties. It's like an Alcoholics Anonymous gathering. So have a glaucoma patient's gathering, give them some tea and snacks, and get to know what their problems are. Sometimes they open out more in a big group when they find out that other people also have the same problems. Written leaflets. We have these written leaflets. We have a dedicated glaucoma department, so we have these leaflets which describes the disease, which describes why the patient has to come back early, has to follow up regularly, what can happen, how the disease progresses. And we have posters, and again, counselors. Mobile messages are the best way you can call your patients back. Have a counselor who will give a message on the mobile to the patient, reminding them that their appointment is due for a certain date and they have the freedom to change that appointment so they can easily communicate. So communication with that patient is the key. Even as we heard in the morning, people who are coming from abroad and are going to come back after a year, we tell them that if you feel of any telltale different signs in your eyes, please see a doctor wherever you are. So this is the counseling cocktail, as we call it in Gujarat. We would call it the mocktail, explaining the disease, the need, the need for lifelong medication, the need for follow-up. 
need for investigations regularly, OCTs and perimetries, which are going to cost something to the patient every time the patient comes, and need for intervention. Add to this co cocktail an acronym called ICE. This is from a counseling journal that we have got. ICE is added to the cocktail. This includes ideas, concerns, and expectations. Ideas. What does the patient have, which, what is his patient's idea about the disease? Of what is glaucoma? Why does IOP rise? And use common examples like the water flowing in the drain. Consequences of raised IOP. Use pictures to show that the field narrows. If you just explain in the air, the patient can't understand. But if you explain using a visual, the patient will understand that what happens if my field narrows. The treatment mechanism. What we are going to do. What is the treatment going to do? What is this fluid in the eye? What is this fluid doing to my eye? And how I'm modifying this fluid flow in the eye and therefore reducing the pressure and therefore reducing the risk to the eye. Concerns for the patient. Once the patient knows he has this disease, he wants to know how bad is it. The vision that I've lost in my periphery, am I going to regain that? No, he's not going to regain. So you have to explain how bad it is and how it is important for him to be regularly following up. He can't just put the drops and go away and then never come back. As Dr. Kamini has already said, side effects of medication are a major concern for the patient. So you need to treat these and change the drugs accordingly. Expectations. There's a study by Dr. Anne uh, Newman Casey which says the patient's expectation from a survey was the simplest thing and the most frequent thing that came out from the survey was how to put the drops. Not all patients have somebody putting the drops for them. Many old people try to put the drops by themselves. And we heard that in the afternoon sessions on how to explain to the patients to put the drops. There's a video on the monitors if you want to see counseling in glaucoma. There's a video if you can see where Dr. Mayuri is explaining how to self-medicate. She's showing you how to uh, you know, stabilize the hand so that the patients can put the drops by themselves. Alternatives to medical treatments need to be discussed with the patients and counsel for SLT and surgery. Finally, it's teamwork. It's not the doctor themselves, it's not the patients, it is doctors, patients, your support staff, and the relatives that are part of this entire game of how effective a counselor you can be, how long this patient will stay with you. In spite of all our efforts, many patients progress and can go to complete blindness, wherein you need to counsel them very differently on encouraging them with their life, to go on with their life. And this is a beautiful example of John Milton, who had complete blindness due to glaucoma and who wrote two of his biggest works, Paradise Lost and Paradise Regained, after he was completely blind. So thank you about counseling. I can take the next. Uh, I'll continue with the next. And that is pseudophagic glaucoma. Tracking pseudophagic glaucoma, find the culprit. And I thank Dr. Vasauda for his inputs and for constantly teaching us everything that we have learned about pseudophagia is from Dr. Vasauda. Essentially, a rise in IOP can be early, intermediate, and late. An early IOP rise immediately after your surgery of the cataract would be a retained oculoviscoelastic device. Intermediate would be a steroid-induced. An IOL placement, I've deliberately put it in the red because sometimes this and this is a major culprit for a pseudophagic glaucoma. A pre-existing glaucoma that we have missed. How come as cataract surgeon, surgeons we would have missed a pre-existing glaucoma? The most common is history taking. Sometimes you have measured the IOP, it's normal, but the patient has not told you that he's putting glaucoma drops. So you have missed that. And the patient thinks that I'm going in for my cataract surgery, so now all drops must go. And immediately after the cataract surgery, you find that the IOP is rising. 
And then you wonder what happened in spite of an uneventful surgery. So history, first thing is ask in any cataract surgery that you're going for, ask the patient, are you on any kind of drops? Retained OVD rise, let's take each of these, would be classically within the first two or three days. You would see a microcystic corneal edema, but most important, the patient would be symptomatic. He would be having either a severe headache, a severe eye ache. When you look at him on slit lamp, it would be a very quiet anterior chamber, a deep anterior chamber. But if you look closely and if you're suspecting the OVD, if you see an OVD on the endothelium, you know it's obviously an OVD. But, and the culprit is more often a visco dispersive OVD, which doesn't get washed out very fast when you're doing the irrigation aspiration at the end of the surgery. So you'll see a microcystic corneal edema. Normally, we don't check the IOP on day one, do we? How often do we check our IOP after the surgery? Do we check on day one? NCT? NCT? No. Yes? On day one? OK. But there is a transient rise in almost 28 to 50% of patients in the first 24 hours in all post-cataract patients. So how will you manage if there is a very significant rise? Again, we don't know what that magic figure is. If you want, we can say it's, say it's above 30. If the patient is symptomatic, obviously you're going to treat this patient with oral drugs, with topical, or even IV mannitol. If the pressure is very high, say in the 40s, we would first give mannitol, bring down the pressure, make the symptom patient asymptomatic, reduce the corneal edema, wait for four or five days. If the IOP, sometimes you may need to repeat mannitol on two consecutive days. So wait for four or five days. If the IOP is still high, we may consider removal of viscoelastic, an anterior chamber wash. But the most important thing is to prevent this OVD. Why should the OVD remain in the eye? if you have washed it. And this is uh, what we do in our uh, surgical practice. At the end of the surgery, IOL is well in the, within the bag. We use a bimanual irrigation aspiration. Just nudge that lens. Now, inside the bag is a very heavy viscoelastic. It is a viscocohesive viscoelastic. This needs to come out. And notice that we have raised the bottle height very high. The inflow of the fluid is high. The vacuum is high. But remember that the irrigation which goes underneath underneath the IOL must be the irrigation and not the aspiration cannula. And then wash out the viscodispersive, viscoelastic, which is there in the anterior chamber, or the viscocohesive, whichever you have used for the IOL implantation. So we come to the next intermediate steroid-induced rise. Usually from one to seven weeks, we will see. And it could be any of the steroids, whether it's prednisolone, dexamethasone, or diflupredinate. These would be steroid responders, which would have a transient IOP rise. And once you stop the steroid the, without any treatment, the IOP will come back to normal. Steroid-induced ocular hypertension, as we said, ocular hypertension guidelines are there, where there is a sustained IOP rise, and you would perhaps need to treat this patient. And the steroid-induced glaucoma, where over a long period of time, there, is, there are disc changes. So these have to be treated. And the drugs of choice would be, first line would be beta blockers, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, alpha agonists. We do not like to use PG analogs in the early post-operative period. And uh, once you decrease or stop discontinue the steroids, sometimes the IOP takes a few months to return to normal. And if steroids are necessary, we switch to the weakest possible drug at the lowest possible dose. Let's come to the crux of the talk, the IOL placement. There are certain signs of something going wrong in the anterior chamber examination, on the anterior segment examination. You will see pigment dispersion, obstruction of the trabecular meshwork, ongonioscopy, transillumination defects, hyphema, and a rise in IOP. All this suggests that something is going wrong. And we have seen multiple studies that single piece acrylic lenses are not meant to be placed in the sulcus. These must be placed in the bag. The diagnosis would be a good slit lamp examination, an anterior segment OCT, and we love the ultrasound biomicroscopy, which gives us a lot of information about the IOL being well placed in the bag. 
You will notice there is a pointer. The IOL that is the anterior capsule, that is the posterior capsule and this is the IOL well placed in the bag, the haptics are in the bag and this distance away from the iris. As against this, on slit lamp if you see this patient, you will see the very well centered IOL in an undilated pupil, you will see, you will think that the IOL is in the bag but on UBM you can see this is the IOL rubbing against the iris. Here it is in the bag, but it, this is an asymmetric IOL fixation. This will cause trouble later, perhaps maybe years later also the IOP may rise. This is a toric IOL in the sulcus. As I said, no single piece IOL should be left in the sulcus and aggressive measures must be taken to reposition this IOL in the bag. A decentered three-piece IOL can also cause the same thing. So management would be if the bag is intact and if you are confident you redial the IOL in the bag provided the posterior capsule is intact. If the posterior capsule is not intact, we can even consider explantation, a scleral fixated IOL, but after explaining the risks of a resurgery. Inflammation induced rise in IOP. Sometimes the IOL is in the bag, but if you see excessive pigment dispersion over the IOL, an anterior chamber inflammation, iris chaffing or transillumination defects, the inflammation will need to be tackled first. So on slit lamp examination, if you see this excessive cellular deposits on the IOL, Inflammation, this is a patient of uveitis with inflammation in the post-op period and the primary doctor who had referred this patient for high IOP said that the IOL was well within the bag and yes, this is the UBM picture of the IOL within the bag but notice this plateau iris and it's constantly rubbing against this uh, IOL and pigment dispersion in the same patient gonioscopically, you can see the excessive pigmentation. Iris chaffing, these are the signs, hyphema, UGH syndrome which worsens over time. So first we need to manage the post-op inflammation with topical oral steroids, reduce the IOP, avoid PG analogs in any inflammatory condition and maybe as IOL exchange. Anterior chamber IOLs as we saw in the morning may not cause any problem for years, but a single piece, this is an actress of IOL in the anterior chamber. So now not only does this patient have glaucoma, but he will need this IOL to be explanted. He will need a corneal surgery. And that's where the teamwork comes in, where we did an IOL explant, a scleral fixated IOL, vitrectomy, and a DSEC. So four surgeons involved with this patient. And this is a one-year post-op picture of this patient with a 612 vision. And pre-existing POAG, as we've already said, a thorough preoperative evaluation before cataract surgery, knowing the disease, and this is much of it is just repetition, I'm not going to go into detail, look at the disc, a glaucomatous disc, and always a disc evaluation, posture segment OCT fields, which is important to give the patient visual prognosis, as well as to counsel the patient about the disease and the medical legal aspects. So angle closure disease, again, is a different, uh, uh, entity altogether and a very challenging entity. What we, I just want to uh, make a last point. How do we manage uh, chronic angle closure at our clinic? Sometimes, actually, if the IOP is uncontrolled and you do a trabeculectomy or you do a AGV surgery, this can get worse. It shallows the anterior chamber even more. It increases the peripheral anterior synechia. So we like to do primarily in such cases with very flat anterior chambers and chronic angle closures, we do a three-piece IOL with a haptic. We do a PCCC and we do a three-piece IOL in the sulcus and optic captured through either an anterior segment capsule or anterior capsulorexis or a PCCC. We have found that capturing it behind the PCCC locks the IOL in its place and doesn't allow it to move and the optic is well away from the iris and it never gives rise to any kind of problem and this is the picture of a patient with chronic angle closure whom we did a primary surgery of an ACCC, PCCC with a three-piece IOL with optic capture. 
With that, I am uh, ready to wind up and we can take questions. Thank, Thank you, you so much. So, uh, you know, we are at the fag end of the day. What is it that the patient likes to hear best when he visits you? Anybody? Yes, please. He is better now, but what does he understand about better? So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm elaborating. What would be better? His pressure is controlled, his glaucoma is controlled, no symptoms. Anybody? How many people feel the patient wants to hear his pressure is controlled? How many people feel that the patient wants to hear my glaucoma is controlled? Okay, so I think fag end of the day, many of you are not raising your hands, but what the patient actually wants to hear is my eye pressure is controlled because his most patients assume glaucoma with a high eye pressure. How many of you have been to a dentist before? Yeah? Okay, so I'll tell you what I do when I visit my dentist. If I have a 12 o'clock appointment, I brush as usual in the morning, maybe once at 9 o'clock, and then once more before I see my dentist. Now, the question I ask myself is, if my patient was to do something like this, he puts his morning beta blocker, and two hours before he comes to me, he puts another drop of beta blocker because he wants to hear that my eye pressure is well controlled. You think that's possible? Okay. So Cass and co-workers did this. They had a large number of patients who were progressing, but when they would ask the patients, they were very sure. They said, we are using our medicines as prescribed. So what they did was they talked to the pharmacy and gave them bottles containing timolol and or pilocarpine. What the patient didn't know was that there was a transducer at the bottom. And to register that the drop was used, the bottle had to be inverted and it would be recorded. When patients came back, obviously about 40 to 50 percent had not used the medicines that required. Now what was interesting was 24 hours prior to their appointment, excess medication was instilled. So pilocarpine was instilled five times a day, timolol was used four to five times a day. So obviously pressure would go down, but the potential for side effects would occur. Just one more word about compliance. A doctor's ability to detect good compliance for a patient is only 50 percent and patients will overstate compliance by 50 by 100 percent so beware of that patient who says i have never missed a drop he's the one who's probably going to be poorly compliant so i think that should be enough glaucoma for it today lots of dinner good dinner and antioxidants best neuroprotective in town thank you very much for being here today thank you very much well i'd like to thank the panelists and all of you again